morning will be from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. It's Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody here. Um, I have a question to start off with. Have you ever wondered what the first language was? You know the language that Adam and Eve spoke? It's not English. (laughs) Well, that's a question that many people have and have had throughout the years, right? Um, There's this guy, Frederick II. He was a monarch in the medieval times, around the year 1200 A.D., That was in his mind. What was the first language that people spoke? Um, King Frederick was a very curious man. He loved the arts and he loved sciences. His curious mind wanted to experiment on things and discover things. He was into astronomy. He was into botany. uh, He was into um, 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 zoology. Like he actually wrote the first ever falconry book. You know, you guys know what falconry is? Falconry is using birds to hunt. He was the first one to write about it in the 1200s. And even up to now, falconers use his work and refer to it, even up to now. But he was also interested in anthropology and maybe psychology. So he conducted experiments and he wanted to figure out which was the first language. Okay, so what do you think he did to discover what the first language was? I know it's weird. What's going to happen, what, what, the next thing that I'm going to say is really dark. Maybe that's why they call the medieval ages dark ages, right? What he did to figure out what the first language was, was he took five babies from their mothers. Dark, right? Yeah, Wayne was like, yeah, dark. And what he did was he had them live separately apart from people. Because he thought they would naturally speak the natural first language. And we know that's not how it works, right, today. But back then, it was different. The babies took care, uh, were taken care of by mute nurses who only fed them. That's it. These nurses were given instructions not to cuddle with the babies, not to give them affection and things like that. And shortly after that, the experiment ended. Do you guys know why? Yeah, the babies, the babies all passed away. He sought to figure out what the first language was with that experiment, but we, what he ended up finding out, and what we end up finding out because of that experiment is something even bigger. That human beings are not just biological beings. Human beings are relational beings. We crave affection. We crave relationships. We are meant to love and be loved. And that is the focus that we have for 2022. Do you guys remember so far? This is the focus that we have for 2022 is relationships. We understand that we are relational beings because God is a relational being. He's a relational God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16, we are told that God is love. And because he is love, since he made us, and he made us in his likeness and his image, we are also people of relationships. Our identities are rooted in love. And that is what we talked about at the start of the year. In January and February, we talked about our relationship with God. Because we are told that the greatest commandment is love. 
Matthew 22, Jesus says, Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then we moved on. As part of that particular uh, verse that Jesus said in Matthew 22, uh, Matthew 22, we moved on in March and April with our uh, with a sermon series on relationships with one another within the church. Because, because Jesus said, yes, the greatest commandment is love, but the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, your, yourselves. Right? That's why we talked about love for one another. But we understand that our love, the love that God has given us, that God cultivated in our mind, soul, and hearts, it's not just for our church family. It's not just for God. It has to go out into the world. That is what we are talking about this month. Wayne started, started us off with that, with our relationship with the world. When he talked to us last week about our relationship with the government, with politicians, with, our, with the authorities, that we are called to respect our government and our politicians. Not because they're good or not because they're bad, but because God wanted us to shine his light through us in that. Okay? So, uh, this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about our relationship with the world. We're, we're going to continue with that. Specifically, we're going to talk about God's vision for us as his people as we interact with the world around us. What is God's vision for his people when it comes to the world, when it, when it comes to our interactions with, with our classmates, with our friends, with our families, with our, with, with our neighbors, with our co-workers? Well, notice this uh, particular uh, verse right here. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody to be saved, not just people here. He wants everybody to come to know him so that they can be in the church. They can be part of his family. We know that. But how does God intend to do this? Okay, now we're inching closer to the answer to the question, well, what is God's vision for us, for his people? Okay? So here's what he's going to do right here. 2 Corinthians 5.18, the Apostle Paul tells us and gives us an insight on what it is. He says, all this is from God. In this portion of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is talking about salvation in God. He says that all this is from God, and this is how he does it. Through Christ, he reconciled us to himself. How does God do it? Well, he did it through Jesus. We know this. Christ died on the cross. We, 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 we hear that every Sunday when we do our Lord's Supper. Because we can't forget that. God reconciled us to himself through Jesus. But it doesn't end there. A lot of times people go, oh, I'm saved. I'm done. I'm going to lock myself up in my own little world and I'm done. We're not done. God has a vision for us. He has this mission that he has given us specifically. And we see that here. He says, God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All of us here are ministers. Miles and I are just your full-time ministers, but in effect, we are all really full-time ministers, aren't we? We have the ministry of reconciliation if we are in Christ. But the Apostle Paul is not, you know, is not, you know, is, is really, he's trying to be clear here. So in verse 19, he reiterates this. He says, not just our salvation, he, just, he didn't just reconcile us. Christ in, God, Christ, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. The world. Not counting their trespasses against them. Because we need to understand that that's, that's what salvation, that's, that's a crux of salvation, is forgiveness of sins. But here it is right here. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You see that? And here's the important bit. This message of reconciliation has been given to all of us. Okay? It's been given to all of us 
And this thing is related to what Soren read as our scripture reading for this morning. God has given us the ability to do this, to tell people about this reconciliation to God, that God wants them back to God or with God by, 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 by making us salt and light for the world. So what is God's vision for the world, for the people, in terms of our relationship with the world? This is it right here. We are to be salt and light to restore the world to God. This is the bottom line of our message this morning. I want us to understand this and realize this and really take this to heart that we are not just saved people. We are, we are people of mission. We are salt and light to restore the world to God because God has made us as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Okay? That is what we are going to do this morning. We are going to understand even further and remind ourselves what these two things entail. What is it to us today that we are salt and light of the world? So, starting with salt. How many of you guys here do not have salt at home? Oh, people don't have salt. There's two hands that came up. They don't have salt at home. That's, that's fine. Because we understand that, you know, too much salt, that's not good, right? But most of us understand that, all of us understand the value of salt, okay? Salt is a very important commodity even to us today because it, it's our seasoning. And I was told by, uh, by, by somebody in culinary arts that it's the only real seasoning. The others, they're not really seasoning, they're flavoring. Only salt actually has the ability to bring out the taste of something, okay? It's, the real, it's a real true seasoning, and it's a preservative. That's why back in the time of Jesus, salt was even more valuable, that they actually used it as money. They called it um, salarium argentum, literally like silver, uh, like silver salt or silver or, or, or money, or, or salt money. They paid their soldiers. You know, the Roman soldiers, the centurions, they got paid in that. Because the word salary came from word salarium. That's, that's salt in, in, you know, in, in Latin, right? They got paid in salt because that's how valuable it was. But we are called the salt of the earth in Matthew 5, verse 13. Now, here's the thing. The first thing that I want us to take away from this is this, that God, that, that Jesus looks at us as salt, means he looks at us as valuable. He didn't say, you know what, guys, you have the potential to be the salt of the earth. If you are in me, you are salt of the earth. Do you see that? And so that means that we, right off the bat, have a purpose in Christ. And this purpose that we have in Christ is huge because we are the preservatives and the seasoning of the earth. This means that wherever Christians are, in whatever circle, social circle we are in, that means that that place is blessed because we are becoming a blessing to the people around us. It means that wherever we are, we are preserving the world or that place or that circle of friends or this activity or that event for God. That's the whole idea. Now, in Mark chapter 9, verse 50, we have a warning. It says in here, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? So there's this thing that salt loses its saltiness. We probably don't understand this today because today you can go to your, your pantry and you can get like this box that is, that what's inside is pure sodium chloride, right? Back then they didn't have access to that. Back then, their salt was full of impurities. And when it's, when it's exposed to the elements, 
the salt particles, they just evaporate or they just dissolve. And you're left with stuff that's not salt. Okay? And then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus tells us what happens to salt back then when it loses its saltiness. People would just chuck it out. They would line their paths with it so it can just it can pave the road. That's what it's good for. Imagine purpose. When salt loses its saltiness, it loses its purpose. It's not salt anymore. And this is one of the biggest things that I want us to draw from this. That being salt and light is our purpose in life. When it comes to the people in, in, in the world around us. We don't have to look far. God has given us this ability and this charge to season and to preserve. Now, here is, here is, uh, here is the, the deal, though. If you're going to be salt, you can't stay in the salt shaker. You have to be poured out onto people. You have to be with people. You can't just say, oh, I have no time for that. <laughs> you got to be with people. You got to have that as your identity that, that explains why you do things. That, that should be our motivation why we want to enter. That's one of, that's one of, that, that should be the priority motivation that's going to lead me to say, you know what? I'm going to take, um, take up skating today or this year. Because you guys, some of you guys know I don't know how to skate, right? Because I want to be able to, as I learn how to skate, I want to be able to be with people so that I can show them my saltiness. Right? That's the same reason why I would want to be in anything that involves other people in it. Because I would want to demonstrate my salt to them so that they can be led to Jesus. That's the idea. Um, according to this passage here, one of the natural implications of being salt is, you see it in the second half of that verse, that when we have salt among ourselves, we will pursue peace with each other. Do you guys see that? Peace with each other. So that means that whenever there's a, wherever there's a Christian in your midst, there's going to be somebody who will be pursuing peace. There will be a peacemaker in your midst. Some of you guys are going, no. That hasn't been my experience. Because some Christians, they're, they're not... You know, they, they are every, there are many things, but they're not peacemakers. Has that been your experience? If that's been your experience, I'm sorry. But that is not how it's supposed to be. And you know what? That is why I believe in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 18, the Lord said this. Okay, are you guys familiar with this passage? It says... There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. At first, that's like a confusing passage, right? What is, what is he talking about? Are there six or are there seven? Well, that, that, that's a literary device that writers back then used to use so that you will focus on the last one in the list. There are seven things that God hates, but the last one is really detestable to him, okay? Shall we go through those lists, through that list? Let's, let's look at it, okay? So, number one, haughty eyes, okay? He doesn't like proud people. Number two, lie, uh, sorry, number two, lying tongue. This, you, you guys will notice that this involves body parts as part of the li literature back then. You know, it's really cool. Eyes, tongue that lies, uh, Hands that shed innocent blood. Heart that devises weak, wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to run to evil. A false witness who pours out lies. In, in, the, in the original language, it's like it talks, it talks about the mouth. Pours out lies or the breath. Right? 
pours out lies. And this is the last one that God really doesn't like. You guys ready for this? A person who stirs up conflict in the community. The opposite of peacemakers. You see, you see, peacemaking is hard because there's no peace and you're trying to make peace. I know this because many of you guys know I was in the military and back then the military, before I joined, the military had this, this identity that we're peacekeepers. You guys understand that? We're peacekeepers or Canadian peacekeeping missions. We would be deployed and we would not have anything on us, not even batons. Because there, were already, there was already peace and we just need to keep it. Because apparently people in the world love Canadians. And when they see Canadians, they go, oh, I don't want to fight. There's Canadians there. <laughs> That's great. But then the mission, the mission shifted with Afghanistan. We now have an enemy. There's no peace, and we, we, we are sent there to make peace. We are now peacemakers, not peacekeepers, peacemakers. We have to make peace. I'm not saying that we need to like shoot people if they're not peaceful or try to make peace because it's, 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 it's different, but it's the same at the same time. But Christians are peacemakers who don't have guns. We are peacemakers who do not use violence to make peace. We use the heart of Christ to make peace. When we talk to people, when we deal with people, when we interact with people, we show and give a blessing to them because of the way that we speak. Because of the way that we treat them, the way that we make decisions. This is what it's like to be somebody who pursues peace. It is an active thing to pursue peace. It's not just something, ah, oh, I'm just going to be nice to you when you start being smart. We don't say things like that. We are patient with people. We are, we are, we are uh, compassionate with people and we forgive people. So when, we, when it says in here that the salt in us enables us to seek and pursue peace with each other, it means that we actively seek and sue for peace. I'll give you an example. And this example comes from my friend Tyler over there. Okay, He's, he, he gave me permission to share this with you because I think it's brilliant. How do you do that, Jay? How do you seek peace and not be obnoxious about it? Okay, Tyler gave us a really good example. Or gives us here a very good example. He works at a store where he deals with customers every single day. And some of the customers that he meets, I don't know, you guys, some of you guys have dealt with retail as well. Maybe the same thing we do. You will have difficult customers. Tyler sees them every day, apparently, or most days. And in this, at this one particular time, he was dealing with a very difficult client, very difficult customer. And you know what he did? He showed his salt. He was patient with the person. He didn't raise his voice at the person. He tried to understand where that person was coming from. Was it successful? Well, his coworker thought it was successful because his coworker came up to him and said, one of the, his coworkers that are way older than him, he said, Tyler, you handled that really well. You were respectful to the person and you did that professionally. Peace without being obnoxious. Salt of the earth. Tyler, you can add that to your name, the Tyler Goche, salt of the earth. You can do that in your emails, okay? That's, that's your title now. So that is a good example there. But the thing is, with being salt of the earth, we need to really, we need, we need to grow. We can't just say, well, you know, I'm going to be salt of the earth tomorrow, right? A lot of times we're going to fail at this, but it comes with growing. You understand this? It comes with growing in our faith, in our maturity, when we mature ourselves, when, 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 when we allow God to mature us, because he says, you know, to follow him and he will make us fishers of men, that he, we will, he will make us good at this, right? We need to believe that. Okay, I'll give you another example of this growth that allows us to be salt of the earth for the people around us. Okay, this example now comes from Ray Zacharias, a good friend of mine as well. 
He gave, he gave me permission to say this to you as well. Because I believe with examples, these things come to light. You know what? We, don't, we know that we can relate to these examples. Ray wanted to eat and watch the game at the same time at a restaurant. All of us have done that or wanted to do that at some point, right? So he goes to this restaurant, but then he decides to say, no, I'm not going to do it. Do you guys know why? Because he realized that where he would, was going to sit down, where the TVs were, he would be staring directly at bottles of alcohol. And he had a problem or, you know, he struggles with that. He's trying to be the, God, the man that God wants him to be. So he said, no, I'm not going to do that. With that attitude and with that mindset, we know that Ray is, is, is really doing his part to being the salt of the earth that God wants him to be for God's glory. Salt of the earth, we can do that without being obnoxious and we can do that as we grow in our faith. Now, being the light of the world, okay? God calls us to be the light of the world as well. Have you guys been in a room that's really totally dark? I have. And it's crazy because, you know, like I'm trying to open my eyes really wide and I couldn't see anything. Sometimes I, 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 are my eyes open? I have to touch my eyes to see if they're open because I couldn't see anything. And I had to go somewhere and everything is dark. So what do I do? I do this. I feel around, right? I feel around. I go like this. But I don't want to do that. I'm pretty sure you guys don't want to do that either. You know why? Because that's dangerous. You might knock something off that's heavy. It could fall on your feet. You could touch something that's sharp. It could cut you. You could trip because you can't see anything in front of you. So I open my eyes, open my eyes. And sometimes they're like, why am I opening my eyes for? But you know what I'm opening my eyes for? You know what you're opening your eyes for when you are in a completely dark place and you, you don't just say, okay, no, I'm just going to close my eyes and walk. You don't. You open your eyes. I open my eyes because we want to see light anywhere. Any hint of light. Because any hint of light will give you an idea of what's around you, right? You don't just want to rely on things that you feel. You don't want to rely on those feelings to understand, oh, this is good. Because there's not going to be any satisfaction in that. With that we just describe what the world is like today. The world without Christ, the light of the world. People in the world are content to do this and say, oh, this feels good. This feels good. I think this is good. Therefore, I'm going to do it. That is what the world is like. They don't need to really see to be convinced. They just need to feel. But Jesus tells us that we are the light of the world. That is the added value that we have in the world for the people around us. We are lights. But here's a problem. Many people that are so accustomed to darkness, what happens when you get out of that darkness and then there's light? It blinds you. It hurts. You don't, you don't want that. You want to stay in the darkness. That's why... John tells us in John chapter 3, verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Now, that's a challenge for us, isn't it? It's a challenge for us, and it becomes a risk, a problem for many of us Christians. Because when that happens, we don't want to be the light for the people that we know. Because then there's a tension right away with our friends, maybe with our family members. They don't like to hear it, so I'm not going to. They don't like to see it, so I'm not going to. They don't want it, so I'm not going to. Right? Back then, when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, they, understand exa they understood exactly what light was about. It's a lamp with oil in it, and it always burns, right? As long as there's oil in it. Today, we have artificial lighting. And sometimes when we're faced with this fact that many people will not like us if we're the light, 
we tend to say to ourselves as Christians, you know what, I'm just going to be, what do you call them, the, a dimmer light Christian. Right? When people around me don't want to, you know, don't want to do some things that are not really in line with what I believe, I'm just going to dim that light. I'm not going to shine because it's not comfortable or convenient for me. But if it's convenient for me, like when I'm in the church, when I'm with people in the church, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that thing shine up there. Oh, amen, brother. That's awesome. Yes, I will do that for God. Yes, I am that for God. We, we switch it up high on our dimmer range there. That's a problem. God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to shine brightly for people. Because it says in here, we are the light of the world. And a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Remember, we just sang that. This is your light. Put it in a bushel. No. We're going to make it shine. Right? People don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. And instead, we put it on a stand. So that it will light the whole house. Now, um, there's another problem. There's another problem. Some Christians think that letting your light, sh light shine, when you do that, you have to be obnoxious. Some Christians think that you're not shining your light if you're not offending anyone. Some people believe that. You know, in social media today, there's this thing that Linda, Linda told me about. It's a trend, or it was a trend not too long ago. And this is what they're saying right here. You guys, have you guys seen that? There's no hate like Christian love. Some Christians think, right, that for me to be able to shine a light to the world, I have to do it out of love. But the thing is, the love that they show to people is not love, it's hate. Because they're mean to people. They make people feel like they're this small. They say mean things in their social media. They put words that Christians should not really use. They say really bad things against other people. And it's not love. Now why shouldn't we do that? We shouldn't do that because being the light of the world doesn't mean that it doesn't give us this this, 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 uh, this license to be mean to people. Okay, what's the opposite of, you know, remember what the, what the defining characteristic of a Christian is? God is love, so we are love. It's love. It's the greatest commandment. What is the opposite of love? It's right there. It's hate. How can we have hate in our hearts and in our minds and say, oh, I'm being a light of the world? It's incongruent. And we need to understand that we were darkness before. If we are if we are going to be like the world, we are darkness. And if we are darkness, there is nothing that we add value to for the world. Nothing. We are supposed to be lights, not darkness. We need to be lights. Look at this. Once you were full of darkness, that should give us an idea on what we should do. When we encounter people that are difficult, difficult like Tyler did. It is easy to do the easy thing. The easy thing is to reciprocate. When somebody is being snarly at you, it is easy to be snarly back. But we have to take the, the road where we become salt and light. Remember? Because we were darkness before, we understand that that person, they're probably in that situation at this time. So we need to show them the light that we now have from the Lord. And so we are going to live as people of light 
And this is the reason why we can be obnoxious. Because we know that the light that's within us produces only what is good and right and true. If we're being mean to other people, as we try to become lights for, for Jesus, then we know that that's not the light that comes from Jesus because it's not good and right and true. Right? So this business of being light of the world is very important. And we need to take this to heart. And here's my last point. I'm not sure if Jesus meant to say this when he said, it gives light to all in the house. You see that? But the way that I take that is, we Christians have to show our light first and foremost where? In our homes. Do you guys know people who have done so much for God, who serve so well with the church, in the community, maybe they're part of an organization at school or at work where they really do a lot of things that accentuate the light of Christ in them. But then at home, totally different person. It's uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable for me because I tell you guys, what I just said there, yeah, it's for you, but it's mostly for me. Because I don't want to be a minister of the Church of Christ who serves, who preaches, who teaches, who, uh, who disciples. And then at home, I am anything but being a light to my children and to my wife. I struggle sometimes with that. You guys know my struggles. You guys know that I struggle with my, with my temper. I struggle with anger. I, str I struggle with being impatient. And sometimes I raise my voice at my children. You know, there's this one time way back, I got a knock on my heart said, I have to apologize to my kids. You know, I didn't want to do that. That was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. Was to go at the level of my kids and tell them, hey bud, remember today? You know what happened? Were you scared at daddy? Did that make you cry? I was afraid to tell them that because I thought if I did that, what would they think about me? What would they think about their dad who's weak? What would they think about my example if I say that to them? I did it anyway. You know, I told them, boys, Esther, I have a problem with that. Will you help me? Will you forgive daddy? Now, I'm going to ask you something. If your husband or wife came to you and apologized to you because of what they've done, and they vowed to change so that they can be the light for Jesus in the world, would you lose respect for them? Would you say all of a sudden, oh, you're weak? No. You know what you would do? You would do this. Look at the bottom of that. You will see their good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Being the light of the world is not about me. It's not about my reputation. It's about his reputation. Brothers and sisters, if that bit at the end there when it says you need to show your light at home first, 
And if you know that you're not doing it, here's what I want you to do. I, want, I don't want you to be angry about that. I don't want you to be rebellious against the church and say, ah, oh, this, is, this, is, this is bogus. I don't want this. I don't want you to, to coop up and say, oh, I'm imperfect. I don't want this anymore because I am like that at home. I don't want to do this. Do not do that. The idea is God is knocking on the door of your heart. Smile because you can still hear it. You can still hear the call. Hey, I, I still need you to be the light of the world. Smile. Be challenged. And come to God in humility saying, Lord, I need your help. I want to be this for my family. Before I am this for my coworkers, for my friends, for my classmates, and for my neighbors. This morning, the message is simple. The message this morning is God's vision for us in our relationship with the world is to be salt and light to restore the world to God. And so I invite all of us to take this to heart. And if you are not in the light yet, you will not be able to radiate the true light, which is Jesus. You need him in, you need him in your life first. I invite you as well to come forward to receive Jesus in the waters of baptism. The song of invitation today is called Be the Light. And as we sing that song, I want us to take that to heart. Let's sing it with the intention of actually doing it. Let's stand and sing.